Yes, Ms. Bresman. Good morning, sir. We have two presentations today that consider the role of Northern Ireland and the Welsh Office in central government decision making in the 1970s to mid 1980s. I'll be starting with the Northern Irish uh, presentation this morning. So I know that you are familiar with the history in this area, but it's important just to understand the context in relation to Northern Ireland. In outline only, from 1922 to 1972, Northern Ireland, of course, was a self-governing um, country through its own parliament and government based in Stormont. And then from 1972 to 1998, it was governed from Westminster under what was known as direct rule. The first point to make this morning, sir, is that the documents in this area are extremely limited. We've set out in the written presentation the searches and the, the steps that the inquiry has undertaken to search for those documents. But it remains, as at today's date, that the material we've got to look at in relation to the Northern Irish office is extremely limited. Um, therefore, there is some hesitation in drawing any conclusions from such a small sample of information. Um, but it appears, at least on the present information that's available, there was only limited, if any, influence exerted by Belfast over Westminster. Well, just, just, just pausing there, uh, if, if indeed uh, we lack documents, of which we have a very large number um, in, uh, in England and quite a large number in Scotland, um, are we aware of any reason why those documents, which are so plentiful elsewhere and relate to many of the same matters, uh, aren't present in Northern Ireland? We're not, sir. As at today's date, we don't have a, a Rule 9 or any information as to why there is such an absence of information. However, as you know, um, in the coming month, there's a presentation being produced on issues around record-keeping, uh, document destruction, absence of records. Because the, the absence of records uh, may be for a, a number of reasons, some good, some not. Exactly. Yes. Well, I, I look forward to finding out what they, what we can be told or learn about the, um, the, the absence, if there is an explanation, um, what that explanation is, uh, or what the explanations are, because I imagine it's probably more than one. Thank you, sir. Um, so the available evidence that we do have suggests, with all those caveats that I've just outlined, um, that the... Northern Irish Department of Health frequently followed the policies um, and procedures established in London. And there seems to be broadly four specific reasons for why that might be the case. The first, of course, is an obvious one. This is a time of lack of security in the political context of the Troubles. Um, much of the political concern at the time was focused on that as an issue. And so you've had all in written evidence about the impact of, of the trouble specifically in Northern Ireland on um, issues of blood. Secondly, is the relative size of Northern Ireland. Um, in comparison to England, it's obviously smaller, both in terms of population and geography. The third possible um, reason is the physical distance from Belfast to London and London to Belfast. Of course, this is a time uh, prior to the availability of treatment travel, the internet, etc. And fourthly, it appears from the documents we've seen that the briefs for medical and administri administrative civil servants in Northern Ireland covered a broader range of matters and therefore there was less specialism and focus in relation to matters of blood and blood products. We've seen some limited evidence, and it's not going to be part of the presentation this morning, but it's in the note, that there was some interaction and some information sharing between the Department of Health in Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland in Dublin. Particularly in relation to the issue of AIDS, we can see some meetings that took 
uh, place in the um, mid-1980s. Now, some of the contemporaneous material uses language that perhaps is a little jarring to modern ears, particularly we've seen references to uh, Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales as the territorials. Um, and there's also the phrase that appears in some of the information we've received of the Celtic fringe. Um, that is not language that the inquiry will be using um, throughout the course of um, the hearing and, and also in the presentation. I'll be referring to Belfast or the, the Department of Health in uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, just just um, reflecting on what you were saying about the particular context of Northern Ireland being um, so much smaller in population uh, and obviously very close to the Republic of Ireland, is there any evidence, for instance, that uh, those uh, who needed treatment uh, in those parts of Ireland, which uh, Northern Ireland, which were some distance from Belfast um, and not easy to, to reach from Belfast, but were closer uh, to Donegal and Sligo, um, both of which have borders with the, um, the Northern Ireland, um, that uh, there may have been sort of cross-border treatment? Yes, sir. You, you've, you've heard evidence on that. You will recall some time ago we had the presentation about the Belfast Haemophilia Centre yes. and the actions of Dr Main. We've uh, received a number of written witness statements from Dr Main. Within the presentation, those references are given, but I believe the um, Belfast Haemophilia Centre presentation lists those cross-border connections with the Republic. So there were cross-border connections to be managed um, somewhere at a political level, presumably, of that sort? Well, I, I assume it begs the question whether those relationships were managed within the hospitals um, and that maybe the regional transfusion uh, centre model or whether it was coming from the Northern Ireland office. On the basis of the information I've seen, I, I don't have an answer to that question, um, but it can be one that we look at in more detail. Yes. Yes, thank you. Now I'm going to start with out an outline of the key players and who the people were um, that were in the Northern Ireland uh, office in the Department of Health at this time. Um, starting from 1979 to 1981, Humphrey Atkins was the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland. He was uh, succeeded by Jim Pryor, who was the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland from the 14th of September 1981 to the 27th of September 1984. Douglas Hurd then took up that role from the 11th um, of September 1984 to the 3rd of September 1985. And then Tom King held the role from September 85 to July 1989. John Patton was the Parliamentary Undersecretary of State for Northern Ireland from the 5th of January 1981 to the 13th of June 1983, alongside David Mitchell. Chris Patton then took up that role from June 1983 to September 1985, and then for a longer stretch was Sir Richard Needham um, from September 85 to 1992. The first CMO, so Chief Medical Officer in Northern Ireland, was Dr Thomas Terence Baird um, from 1973 to 1978, followed by Dr Robert Weir, called Bob in a lot of the papers, 1978 to 1988, and then Dr James McKenna, 1988 to 1995. And so the inquiry has received a witness statement from Dr McKenna, which is fed into the presentation. Then we've also received a, a written statement from Dr. Robert McQuiston, who was the Assistant Secretary of the Health Services Division of the Department of Health in Northern Ireland from 1984 to 1998. And Sarah, as you know, he's giving oral evidence, um, albeit remotely, at the inquiry on Friday. We've also received, as I've said, um, a range of witness statements from Dr. Main, who is the Director of the Belfast Haemophilia Centre. Um, and there is the se separate presentation on that. She appears in some of the documents we've received and also was a, a tender at some of the most important meetings during this period. 
albeit not in any capacity within the Department of Health um, for Northern Ireland. In the last few weeks, months, possibly even years, we've heard a lot of evidence from politicians and civil servants who've come to the inquiry to give their evidence orally but also in writing. They have been asked um, a range of questions about the interaction between Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales with the Department of Health in London. Now, the full references to those comments are set out in the presentation, but I'm just going to draw together some of that evidence orally. Particularly in the absence of written documentation, it's useful evidence to see what their individual and collective recollections are about the interaction between Belfast and London. So the first um, that I'm going to reference is Lord Owen, who was obviously the Minister of Health from 1974 to 1976. And he described the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland as taking decisions that these would, quote, tend never to go against the grain of decisions made in England. He noted in his oral evidence to the inquiry that they had the freedom to do so if they wanted, but his uh, recollection is that those decisions didn't go against the grain of decisions taken in England. The next aspect of oral evidence um, relevant for these purposes is Lord John Patton, and he had these two roles that I've explained. The first was the Parliamentary Undersecretary of State for Northern Ireland, and that was January 81 to June 1983, and then he became the Parliamentary Undersecretary of State uh, for Health from June 83 to September 85. Now, in that second role, he made comments um, when questioned about the role of Northern Ireland, and what he told the inquiry was that while he didn't have re responsibility for health in Northern Ireland, it was his view that, quote, UK-wide policy was in reality led by England by virtue of greater population slash resources. Lord Fowler, we heard evidence from him relatively recently. He was, of course, the Secretary of State for uh, Health and Social Security from September 81 to June 87. And he said this, on health issues generally, his recollection was that Scotland tended to be the most independent, whereas Wales and Northern Ireland more closely followed the Department of Health in London. He said, in his view, anything that the Department of Health did in relation to health, quote, tended to be followed in other areas, not so much in Scotland but certainly in Wales and Northern Ireland. So Lord Fowler there, Sarah, is making a distinction between um, those three territories and specifically saying that, um, in his view, Northern Irish um, decision-making tended to follow that of London. We also heard very recently from Baroness Bottomley. She was the Secretary of State of the Department of Health from 89 to 92. And she said this about the Department of Health in London, that they were, quote, hugely better resourced, more experts, more committees. We've had oral and written evidence, sir, from Dr. Morris McClelland. Now, he was the director of the Northern Irish Blood Transfusion Service. And his evidence um, was that policies adopted by Northern Ireland typically followed, that was his quote, typically followed those of London. He gave a series of examples in his oral um, evidence to the inquiry of where those policy um, aspects had been followed. One was the application of the National Blood Transfusion Service Memorandum on the Selection, Medical Examination and Care of Blood Donors. So his evidence was that that was a UK-wide policy and it was followed in Northern Ireland. He also, in his oral evidence, uh, was asked about the position of surrogate testing for non-A, non-B hepatitis, and his evidence was that Northern Ireland followed the approach in the rest of the United Kingdom and didn't introduce such um, testing. We've also heard evidence from Dr Hilary Pickles, um, and she was the principal medical officer at the Department of Health in London from May 19, 
86 to June 1991. And she had quite a lot to say in her evidence about Northern Ireland. And she said this. She described the Northern Irish contingent as, quote, very, very small and was so grateful for anything we could do on their behalf and lapped up what we said. She also describes notifying the Northern Irish Office and the Welsh Office of policies or meetings, sometimes as an afterthought. And she describes occasionally getting, quote, grumbles from those civil servants and politicians because they hadn't been notified earlier. Um, she also describes Northern Irish and Welsh officers as piggybacking on advice that was received from the Department of Health in London. Lastly, Dr McQuiston has said in writing, but as I've said, he's giving all evidence from Friday, that he has, quote, no memory of the Northern Irish office having a distinctive role in health policy development in Northern Ireland, apart from the Northern Ireland office ministers having to sign off on policies developed by the department. So, so that's not a total picture. You've heard all the evidence and you've heard it recently, so I'm not going to read it aloud to you. Um, but broadly, the evidence we've received, it, there, there isn't a great deal of recollection about a um, strong contribution of Northern Ireland in relation to decision-making that happened in London. We're now going to take you through some of the documents that we have, and as I've said, they're fairly limited, and just give you some specific examples of interactions with Northern Ireland and draw conclusions where we can. So the first relates to the issue of supply of blood and blood products, and there's just going to be two examples. So if, Lawrence, we can go to DHSC 3021... 89 underscore 014. Brilliant. So we can see at the top um, that this was a report of the working group on the trends and demand for blood products. Now, Sarah, I should say that this presentation doesn't deal with all of the evidence in relation to self-sufficiency. Um, you've heard that in other sources. But this document shows that the working group was appointed in January 1977 by the Department of Health and Social Security, so that's London, who, in consultation with the Scottish Home and Health Department and the Welsh Office, decided that it would help in planning the future developments of blood transfusion services, the likely trends in the demands for blood and blood products were known. So we can see there, as at 1977, the purpose of this working group did not include any real consideration, or the consultation, I should say, for the establishment of this group, did not include Northern Ireland. So while Wales and Scotland are part of the consultation, we don't see any reference to Northern Ireland. Then, Lawrence, just scrolling down to that um, list of people, we can see... There's no um, specific Northern Irish representation. You can see at point six, there's some Scottish representation. Um, and seven, you can see some representation from London. But there's no specific um, Northern Irish involvement there. There's no specific Welsh involvement either, is there? There isn't, sir. We'll, Although we'll if one goes back up to the top... Wales were consulted. Yes, We'll come on to look at Wales um, in the second presentation and you'll, you'll see how things develop there. But you're right to say that there was no members listed from Wales as far as I can see. Now, the next document on this um, broad topic of blood supply... Do, do, do we know if, um, in looking at the trends in demand for blood products, this working group considered the position in Northern Ireland or not? This particular document, as far as I'm aware, doesn't make any express reference to Northern but Ireland. But other documents from the same working well, group? Well, I'm, I'm just about to take you to one that might ah. answer that question. DHSC 5064 
0.50. Yeah. So next page, please, Lawrence. Having said that I'm not going to do anything on self-sufficiency, this um, is about self-sufficiency, but I hope you'll forgive me. So top of the page, this is a meeting um, of the 1st of December 1980 with the Scottish Home and Health Department, Department of Health and Social Services for Northern Ireland and the Welsh Office to discuss UK self-sufficiency in blood and blood products. So this appears to be a meeting um, between those, those three nations where um, issues of planning for blood and blood products was discussed. And we can see in the middle of that membership list, Dr Acton is attending on behalf of the Northern Irish Department of Health. Now, if we scroll down, please, Lawrence, to paragraph two. So I hope this will answer the question that you were just asking me, um, which is a consideration of the total need for blood products in the UK and how these need to be met. Now, if we look in that um, paragraph two, um, about five lines up from the bottom, there's a reference of Scotland was almost self-sufficient. You see that there? And it goes on to say, but Northern Ireland's needs would have to be considered. So there's a reference to um, needing to understand the position for Northern Ireland, but no specific breakdown um, of the amount of factor rate needed in this paragraph. Um, and we can see at the bottom, it says, although at the moment England, Wales and Northern Ireland were being supplied by BPL, it was agreed that the Protein Fractionation Centre Edinburgh could play a role and help, help meeting that total. You've had a lot of evidence about that, sir, and I'm not going to repeat it. But this is a document that looks to be including Northern Ireland in a, a, a broader framework of what blood products are needed. If we could then go to paragraph 7, which will be on the next page, please, Lawrence. We can see here um, that this possibility is being floated, that Edinburgh would fractionate plasma from the four northern English regions and from Northern Ireland. Dr Acton agreed to discuss this uh, w discuss with his department and the logistics of sending plasma to Edinburgh. So here we see Dr Acton taking an active role in this meeting, contributing uh, to discussion points. And then if we can go to paragraph 12 of the document, right at the bottom, there's a discussion on the pro rata distribution for blood products in Northern Ireland. And there's a suggestion there um, that Northern Ireland might fare badly under that proposal for a pro rata distribution. And Dr Acton has noted um, that in the future, Northern Ireland hoped to send 5,000 litres of FFP in addition to uh, 3,500 litres of time expired plasma. Now, this issue about the relationship between uh, Northern I Irish blood production and Scotland has been addressed in an entire presentation by the inquiry. Um, just for the note, it's INQY40343 for anyone wanting to read more about that. Um, they can do so. So, so they, those are just two examples of um, Northern Irish interaction or lack of interaction in relation to broader questions of UK uh, blood supply. Yes, the, the, the first document, the working party you showed me, was 1977. Yeah. This is very nearly four years later because it's December 1980. Yeah. Um, and there's nothing, no document that we have been able to discover which shows anything to do with trends or, for that matter, supply of blood products internally um, between those two dates. Not that I've seen, um, sir, and we can put this as a, a, a topic on the list for further investigation. So although it may have been assumed that Northern Ireland would, would do whatever uh, was happening elsewhere in the UK, um, there's no specific consideration of Northern Ireland between those dates. I'd have to check that. So obviously we've got an entire presentation that deals with self-sufficiency. Um, but, but from the documents that I've looked at for this presentation, there isn't any significant uh, document I've seen. But throughout this period, 
uh, the uh, administration in Northern Ireland was under direct rule? Yes, sir. You? Now we're going to look at some hepatitis examples, and these are earlier in the chronology. Um, if we could start with DHSC um, 01030097 underscore 029. Now, so you can see, I hope, it's a little bit blurry, there we go, 2nd of July 1971. So this is a document that's before direct rule, and you can see at the top it says Government of Northern Ireland, Ministry of Health and Social Services. Um, we can see that this is a letter going to the Department of Health and um, Social Security based in Elephant and Castle in London. And the topic of discussion here is the hepatitis advisory group. Um, and just for clarity, Lawrence, if we just scroll down, we can see that it's a document from um, B.E. Swain, who's a senior medical officer. So just going back up to the top, um, there's a suggestion here from reading this document that Mr. Swain or um, members of the Northern Irish um, administration were members of the hepatitis advisory group. We can see that he says he was unable to get to the last meeting that was held in London. Um, and then what we see in this document is his contribution to matters that are being discussed as part of the hepatitis advisory group. Um, and what we can see here is his contributions in relation to issues about hospital accommodation. So if we look at the uh, fourth paragraph down that starts with regard um, he's recalling some earlier discussions um, and put some suggestions forward and then says this this is certainly the thinking over here and we will I hope be able to achieve this object in the foreseeable future so possibly an example of information exchange coming from Belfast to London but obviously this is strictly before um, direct rule, so this is July 71. Now the next um, document is from a little later in the 1970s, DHSC 3021831028. underscore zero two eight. So we can see it's a document from um, 20th of April 1977 and it's about um, hepatitis B and if we look at paragraph 2, it sets out some history for us there in relation to what was happening about hepatitis in the 1970s. So in 1970, an advisory group was set up to advise the Secretaries of State for social services for Scotland and for Wales on the testing of blood donations and specimens for what was then known as Australian hepatitis-associated antigen. So pausing there, you might say this is another reference to Scotland and Wales only, but if you look at the date, 1970, it's not within direct rule. So this is pre-direct uh, control from Westminster goes on to say that the first report of this group was made in 1971, but in 1972 a revised report modified in light of consultation was issued. This was accepted in Northern Ireland and issued to the former Northern Ireland Hospitals Authority in January 1973 and to the former Northern I uh, Ireland General Health Services Board and the local medical and dental committees in May 1973. So we can see that the reports or recommendations from this um, early advisory group, even though it started outside the temporal um, structures of direct rule, were accepted by the Northern Irish Office in 1971, 1972 and distributed in 1973. Well, that, that would be the Northern Ireland Government, I think, rather than the Northern Irish Office. Yes. Yeah. Um, now, we've got some material in... You can take that down, thank you, Lawrence. We've got some material in relation to the hepatitis advisory group, 
and I won't put them up, but there's evidence of a Dr Logan from the Northern Irish Department of Health attending meetings on behalf of Northern Ireland. However, as I said, there are very few documents from the 1980s. There's one example that I'll put up. It's M-A-C-K 4075 underscore 005. So if we can zoom in on this, thank you. This is 21st of July, 1981. Um, and this looks to be the third report of the advisory group on testing for hepatitis B. Um, what we can see here is that the Department of Health in London are sending to the General Hospital branch of the Department of Health and Social uh, Services in Belfast the reports that it had produced on hepatitis B. And also, we can see a set out, a kind of distribution list of who that information has gone to. So it's gone to regional transfusion directors, regional medical and scientific officers, brackets, the Northern Ireland scientific officer included because he attends um, meetings here and receives papers from the department. I think that must be regional scientific officers, wasn't it? I R think it R must. R it's S C O little s. I think it is, sir. Um, it's slightly hard to read on my copy. And to members of bodies who have an interest in the report. So a fairly broad circulation of this information produced by the advisory committee in relation to hepatitis B. Um, not the most illuminating documents there, but it, it does show some distribution of knowledge and information about hepatitis B um, in 1981. The next uh, topic where we can see some evidence in relation to interactions between Belfast and London is that of HIV and AIDS. Um, the available information we have appears that Northern Irish representatives were not included um, in uh, Westminster-based correspondence over the line to take in relation to AIDS. We will come to look, on the, look at those documents in more detail when we get to Wales, um, but just as a matter of fact, it doesn't appear that they were included in that correspondence. There was also no representation from Northern Ireland present at the first meeting of the Medical Research Council Working Party on AIDS. That took place um, on the 10th of October, 1983. There is evidence there, as I've hinted, that um, individuals who were prominent in the uh, Northern Irish um, medical community at this time, people like Dr May and Dr McClelland were attending some of these important meetings about AIDS that were starting in, in the 1983 onwards. But I haven't seen any evidence that departmental officials, civil servants, either from a, a medical or administrative basis, were attending those meetings or in any way shaping Westminster policy on AIDS. One example that we have of um, Northern Irish Department of Health following the approach of Westminster is in relation to the AIDS leaflet that was produced. Um, it was obviously produced in London, and the evidence is that it was in circulation in Northern Ireland. Now, Northern Irish officials were copied into discussions and correspondence about the production of that leaflet. But Dr McClelland has said in his oral evidence to the inquiry that, quote, no serious consideration was given to producing a leaflet specific to Northern Ireland. Um, his evidence was that there were differences in the implementation in relation to the leaflet, and I'll come on to those in a moment, but there was no consideration to Northern Ireland producing its own leaflet. Now, he referred to Northern Irish society, this is his language, being quite conservative, um, and that there were concerns about the impact of the leaflet on donors. Um, he also expressed the view in his oral evidence to the inquiry that there were less risk factors in Northern Ireland. Um, his evidence 
is that there were lower levels of intravenous drug use um, and the particular context of Northern Ireland, and this was some questioning from Miss Richards, as you'll recall, was that homosexuality was illegal until 1982. So a, a, a different um, context there, perhaps. And what he described was a gradual approach in relation to the implementation of that leaflet. The position was initially in uh, 1984, December 1984, you'll recall, sir, that leaflets were left or displayed for a period of about six weeks. They weren't handed to people directly. And then there was a move into people being handed leaflets directly and to being sent leaflets. So that's one example, sir, of Belfast following Westminster, but there being some slight differences in relation to the implementation, um, in relation to the AIDS leaflet. Now, the next... Well, as far as the, the AIDS leaflet is concerned, different regions in uh, the UK, um, mainland, um, in England, certainly England and Wales, uh, they took their own course, didn't they? Yes. So uh, there was the modification in uh, North London of, uh, of the leaflet following um, uh, the uh, visit by, by Contreras to, um, to New York, I think, um, I seem to re recollect. And, and certainly uh, different regions had different ideas about what they, the way in which they called up donors. So for some, they used donor cards, it was much more difficult to put a leaflet in. So they didn't use that method. So different um, different regions had different approaches. So for, rather than following um, or, or not following Westminster, um, was this perhaps an example of Northern Ireland being, as it were, its own region? Perhaps. I think the point I was making was that there was no amendment as far as I've seen and as far as Dr McClelland has told this inquiry as to the content. Um, it, it was produced and then just circulated. But I fully accept there is evidence in front of you about differences in implementation both in England but also in Northern Ireland. And Dr McClelland has given a couple of possible reasons for why that approach and implementation was different. Yes. Um, but it, it's difficult to, uh, without further evidence, link um, the actions of Dr McClelland and the Northern Irish Blood Transfusion Service with any specific direction from the Northern Irish office. I haven't seen that as a kind of documentary so trail. <laughs> If it was considered in uh, respect of Northern Ireland by the Westminster government, um, then we have no sign uh, of that in any recovered document. Not that I've seen. I haven't seen any direct um, evidence on that point. Thank you. Um, now, in relation to AIDS, there's an, another document that I'd like to put up, CBLA... Three zeros one nine one four underscore zero zero seven. So this is a, a document from nineteen eighty four. I'm not sure if we just scroll to the bottom, Lawrence, whether there's a specific date on it. So yeah, November nineteen eighty four. So top of the page, please. Um, this was the working group on AIDS that was part of the advisory committee on the National Blood Transfusion Services. And we can see at the top the reason for the establishment of this working group. So it was to consider the implications for the National Blood Transfusion Service of testing blood donations for antibody to HTLV3 and to report. Now, a quick scan down the membership, lots of names that the inquiry is familiar with there. Um, and then there's a heading, Observers, and we can see that Professor Bloom is noted to be attending on behalf of the Welsh Office, which might be interesting evidence in itself, and we'll come on to discuss that. And there's representation from um, 
elements of the Department of Health in London, from the Army, and also the Scottish National Blood Transfusion Service. And then we can see in brackets, NI, presumably Northern Ireland, were invited but declined. Unclear to us, sir, what the reason for that um, invitation being declined was. November 1984, not apparent um, on the documents why Northern Ireland uh, chose not to be involved in this meeting. However, there is evidence from other documents from July and October 1985 with meetings of the expert advisory group on AIDS. So you've had a lot of evidence about that as a group. Dr. Donaldson, um, who was part of the Department of Health of Northern Ireland, is listed as attending those two meetings. So July and October 1985, he's attending the expert advisory group on AIDS. So it wouldn't be a correct reading of the documents to suggest that the Northern Irish Department of Health didn't want to play any role in relation to meetings and expert committees for AIDS. It's just not clear from the information we have why they didn't attend this particular meeting. Um, then last document to look at on Northern Ireland, CB, um, CABO 400221. Lots of handwritten amendments to this document, but we can see it's dated the 19th of December 1985. Um, and there's reference uh, to an interdepartmental group of on AIDS. And we can see from the heading that this is a, a letter sent from the Department of Health in London at Elephant and Castle. Um, what we can see here is that there was a meeting of a ministerial steering group on AIDS held on the 2nd of December 1985. Um, and if we just skip down this document, please, Lawrence. Is there a membership list? There should be. If there isn't, yeah, is there one on the next page? Thank you. So if we can um, look at this in some detail, you can see so that this is a fairly broad membership list, fairly busy meeting, and we can see in the left-hand column all of the different departments that are being represented. So it's Defence, Treasury, Cabinet Office, Employment. It's not merely the medical departments. Um, and we can see four departments up from the bottom, Dr McQuiston, who you'll hear from on Friday, was attending this interdepartmental um, government meeting. There is no specific discussion on Northern Ireland within this document, and on my reading, Dr McQuiston doesn't make any oral contribution, um, but so it's evidence as at the middle of the 1980s, 2nd of December 1985, of Northern Irish involvement in um, Westminster and broader into de departmental meetings. So, so those are the documents that we wanted to draw your attention to and we wanted um, people to see. It is a very limited pool, as I've said. Um, one possible uh, conclusion, I put it no higher than that, from the available written and oral evidence we've heard, is that the Department of Health in Northern Ireland was guided by or followed the direction of the Department of Health um, in London um, rather than there being any currently any evidence of um, an independent path forged on, on many of these issues in relation to blood and blood products. So, so that's the position with Northern Ireland. I don't know if there's anything you want to raise before we either take a break or move on to Wales. Uh. No, I, 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 I don't think so. Um, how long do you reckon uh, you're going to be talking about Wales? Um, there are not a lot of documents. There are slightly more than Northern Ireland. I think I'll probably be um, an hour, an hour and a half, something like that. 
yes. Um, a, a natural break would normally come now. It's a little bit early. Mm. But... Um, Did you intend to start off um, dealing with Wales with the availability or lack of it of documents? I don't as much in, in Wales. It's, it's less of a, a key theme. Um, but th there are issues about the availability of some documentation for Wales. Yes. Um, well, I think we've taken an early coffee break um, uh, and come back at quarter past eleven. It looks as though uh, then we may be finished uh, for the day round about 12.30, probably, if, if, if that helps with the, your, your planning for the, the day. It might be in the, this weather that that's appreciated, so I'm not sure, but um, thank you. Well, no later than. <laughs> yes. OK. Um, well, let's, let's make it um, 20 past 11. Uh, and it, it's probably just as well that the timing works out that way, given the, the challenges which the heat outside uh, may throw up later on in the day, in particular. But thank you. 20 past 11.